Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're so glad to welcome you as part of our community tonight. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and distributed live stream. By entering this virtual meeting room, you give your consent to be recorded and distributed by Vienna Live with Simeon Morrow and other third parties. If you prefer to not be recorded, please turn off your camera and microphone and or go to the Facebook Live video feed, the link to which I'll now place in the chat room. For a better experience, please turn off your microphone and set your video to gallery view. This show thrives on participant contributions and all participants are encouraged to actively participate in this webinar by asking questions and making comments. To do so, please either write in the chat room, raise your hand or turn on your microphone and say hi and I will be delighted to include your perspective in the conversation. Tonight, our featured guests are Andrea Ciucci, a Catholic priest and coordinating secretary at the Pontifical Academy for Life, as well as Secretary General of the Vatican Foundation, Ren A.I. Sons for Artificial Intelligence Ethics and author of the new book, Pardon Me, But Why Are You Here? And Claudia Laricchia, Head of Institutional Relations and Global Strategic Partnerships at the Future Food Institute and professor at the Rome Business School. Also joining us tonight is Dr. Lino Rivera, professor of music at St. Mary's College of California. Claudia, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me here. It's an honor to be with all of you. Thank you. Our honor. So Claudia, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. Yes, sure. Uh, I'm, as you said, uh, uh, I'm the director of the institutional relations of the Future Food Institute. We just uh, saw this wonderful video wrapping up uh, our uh, global mission. Uh, and I'm specialized actually in the impact of food technology on climate change. Um, I was also trained in Pittsburgh by Al Gore. Uh, so um, I'm part of the network of climate leaders uh, uh, that is training uh, uh, all over the world. As you said, I teach in the Rome Business School and I'm very active uh, in many uh, association for uh, women empowerment uh, and also for young talents empowerment. Wow, inspiring. So Claudia, tell us a little bit, uh, um, just to take one of those many aspects of your uh, inspiring career, tell us about the video we just saw about the Future Food Institute. What is the Future Food Institute exactly? And how did you get involved? Like you said, you're uh, doing climate work, stuff like that. Tell us about the Future Food Institute. Yeah, Future Food Institute uh, is a no-profit organization that is based uh, uh, in Italy, in Bologna, and in Pollica, that is in the south of Italy. 
uh, and also in San Francisco and in Tokyo. Uh, Future Food Institute uh, is the home of uh, uh, humans that uh, uh, want to act on climate. So we train people uh, together with uh, FAO, uh, but also with many different partners. Uh, but at the same time, we train them to act on climate. Uh, as UN says, uh, uh, this is the decade of action. So we definitely um, are uh, um, using, let's say, this time that we have uh, ahead uh, to uh, not only inspire, but also to uh, teach humans uh, uh, how to have a positive impact uh, on the planet. Of course, uh, through uh, te food technology, but also food innovation, which is uh, um, an innovation related to our mindset uh, more than uh, um, the tools that we all uh, uh, know. Uh, so with this mission, uh, we work uh, also with food industries uh, all around the world with their uh, R&D departments uh, uh, in order to innovate uh, processes uh, and products. Uh, Sara Roversi is the president of the Fisher Food Institute uh, and is uh, the mastermind behind this global ecosystem that is uh, uh, also inspiring me a lot to uh, experiment new uh, ways uh, uh, to follow the change that we need to see in, in the planet. Okay, let's take another look at a video of yours, like you said, about the climate change aspect of the Future Food Institute. Fantastic. So let's get into right away uh, Father Andrea's new book, and we can talk a little bit about through this passage then um, how the Future Food Institute is affecting climate change. So Claudia, in Father Andrea's new book, pardon me for asking, but why are you here? Which we will present more in detail in a moment. He introduces you and Sarah Roversi uh, and the work you do at Future Food Institute in a chapter entitled challenges. On page 87, he writes, and this is my translation from Italian to English, it's in the Italian city of Polica where Sara Roversi and Claudia Laricchia, an expert environmental manager, call on me to speak at a continuing education course offered by the Future Food Institute. Here, I discover another side of the food question. Between the walls of a castle that towers over the capital of the Mediterranean diet, Sara starts talking to me about regener regenerative agriculture and about how the challenge of nutrition will be vanquished by transforming agricultural systems, modifying industrial models, even those of the largest multinational companies, testing new systems of governance. She and Claudia are convinced that the future of food will be based on making the best use of small producers, regional products, rural areas, and legacy techniques that are wisely reconceived for the 21st century. So please, Claudia, tell us about sustainability according to the Future Food Institute. Yeah, indeed, uh, uh, the video that we have uh, uh, seen uh, actually is the answer to this question uh, and also to the question, uh, how did you get future food? So with the, uh, actually the heritage of bringing uh, the impact of food technology on, uh, on climate change uh, on top of the um, diplomatic part. Uh, so um, as, you, uh, as you said, uh, 
um, sustainability um, is a very delicate concept uh, uh, and we humans uh, should be very um, aware that uh, we are uh, eating what we are polluting uh, and on the contrary we are polluting by eating uh, because uh, agriculture and food systems in general are actually producing the 30 percent of greenhouse gases emissions so through technologies, a leverage of sustainability, and of course, through awareness and through our food choices, uh, we can change uh, this uh, uh, problem that actually we are seeing. Uh, it's a deep problem related also to uh, water, uh, soil, um, energy, all the natural resources uh, uh, that we are uh, wasting uh, indeed agriculture actually is using the 70 percent uh, uh, of uh, water um, and we can uh, also through technology like thinking to precision agriculture um, avoid uh, this kind of waste that we cannot afford anymore it's interesting that we are starting from pollica uh, it is this tiny rural, uh, rural village in the south of Italy, uh, which is very emblematic uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the possibility to implement the integral ecology model that we are already experimenting there with the farmers, the fishermen, so with all the stakeholders uh, of, uh, of the food value chain uh, in a mix of uh, uh, education, innovation and community that you saw uh, in the video. So um, sometimes we think about uh, uh, innovation as something that is disruptive for the current models. Uh, indeed, it can be something that can allow us to protect uh, uh, traditions uh, uh, and to look at the, the biodiversity, to protect natural resources, uh, uh, and in a word, to actually be more sustainable. Wow. So uh, t tell us, Claudia, why is it that we hear so much about uh, greenhouse gases, about uh, carbon emissions, and we're not hearing that so much um, in the context of food, like you said, eating food, consuming food is also polluting? Mm, I think that uh, not all the stakeholders or not all the people uh, or humans, as we are saying during this event, uh, uh, are uh, actually uh, aware of the impact of their food choices. Uh, uh, this is something related to uh, a complexity of elements uh, uh, like the behavior of big food industries, uh, uh, but also the behavior uh, of farmers. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, they are incentive uh, to um, actually raise their production uh, or uh, to think about, of course, to think about prices. Uh, I was told by a scientist uh, um, a week ago that uh, um, that I was wrong talking about uh, uh, the exist, the, um, talking about uh, uh, the need to break uh, the um, trade-off between sustainability and competitiveness. Uh, and I was explained that, for instance, the European Union policy farm to fork, which is a benchmark for all over the world, uh, can create this trade-off. Uh, and my answer was uh, that we should stop thinking uh, with uh, the same mindset uh, that created the problems we are facing. Uh, we should actually um, we should actually use a different uh, uh, KPI, different indicators, and giving farmers uh, the opportunity to uh, take care more and more about biodiversity and to understand that uh, the quality, the nutrients, uh, taking care of soil is something that uh, will uh, let them survive. Because it's it's clear that uh, uh, as soon as we just use prices uh, uh, to take choices uh, for them, uh, they, they don't have choice anymore uh, that take price as uh, the, the most important indicator, which is completely wrong for uh, the entire ecology models. Um, that's why, in my opinion. 
Understood. So uh, you're saying that this idea of uh, going after the best price, that governments can kind of, uh, they can change behavior by applying uh, different taxes or different, um, different um, how do you say, that if they uh, convince farmers, okay, that's going to be economically the best for you, it's not necessarily yeah, the best strategy. Exactly. We all should... Uh... Um, embrace uh, new models uh, and not uh, keep using the same indicators that brought us uh, to models that uh, that are actually overshooting resources uh, and over polluting uh, also through the food systems. Fantastic. Let's take another look at an, another video of, about the work of the Future Food Institute. Fantastic. Wow. So uh, we have at this point, uh, our other guest has joined us. Welcome, Father Andrea. I think you need to turn your microphone on. The microphone. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation. So Father Andrea, can, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your work? Oh, my so I'm a Catholic priest and uh, I'm the, the secretary and coordinator of the central office of the Pontifical Academy for Life. That is a, a Vatican office uh, that gather uh, 164 uh, great scientists in all over the world and uh, scientists uh, that came from different uh, fields from different cultural traditions, from different religions, but uh, united by the convincement that uh, their research is uh, for human life. This is uh, our, this is the goal we have. Oh, wow. And the central office uh, uh, try to coordinate the work uh, of uh, this academy. Wow, fantastic. So let's get right it's to really your fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> let's get right to your new book. Um, so which is entitled Father Andrea, pardon me for asking, but why are you here? Yeah. So you dedicate the new book to the man himself to Pope Francis, and you qualify that dedication by writing quote unquote, because it's his fault. Absolutely. <laughs> so please tell, yeah. us this, tell us the story about this book. And I'll show everybody the, the pictures of it. Well, really, the, the fault is uh, of Pope Francis, because Pope Francis, uh, six years ago, uh, reshaped our academy and uh, told us two things. Uh, the, first thing the first thing is, Please note that human life is not important only in the first five minutes and in the last five minutes. The typical topics of Catholic bioethics, abortion uh, or uh, euthanasia, for example. But please remember that uh, probably there are also 
80 years between the first and the last five minutes. And if you want to promote human life, you must take care of all the human life, not only the first five minutes and the last five minutes. We have, we must be pro-life in every minute, not only in a part. This is the, the first point. And the second thing that, thing that uh, Pope Francis told us was, uh, please remember that human life is not a Catholic topic. It's not a Catholic argument, but it is an argument uh, for, all the, the, for all the people who have it in this planet. And please discuss about human life, not only among Catholics, but please discuss and work with all the people interested in promoting human life. And so we have scientists from different uh, tradition, cultural, uh, and culture, and, uh, and religious, for example. And so uh, these uh, two indications uh, pushed us outside the, 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 the church. And uh, we started to discuss and to work, to listen, for example, to, uh, to, 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 yes, yes, to, to listen uh, different experiences, uh, different words, uh, different uh, scientific fields. For example, Pope Francis uh, appointed as a member of the academy an engineer and uh, when he did uh, it, uh, some people uh, said, why an engineer uh, for human life? Yes, because technology is changing our human, our life. And so we need to discuss and to understand how an engineer thing uh, is work and uh, is and uh, is a research. So uh, uh, <laughs> we started to to meet people, to visit laboratories, to listen to scientists. And uh, the book is a, a sort of a relationship of, of uh, a diary of, uh, sorry, uh, of uh, these meetings. Okay. So it's let's take a look yeah. at uh, one of those meetings that's very important. This is the Ren A. Isons, which you have been intimately involved with. Father Andrea, let's take a look. Yes. Let's, this brings us to our first round table, food and artificial intelligence. What's the connection? On page 24 of Father Andrea's new book, he writes, and this is my translation again from the original Italian. The evening isn't yet finished, however. At these kind of conference meetings on the development of artificial intelligence technologies, there is almost always a dinner. And it's here that the shirt that makes me stand out sometimes takes its revenge. Around the table, the conversation can easily turn to more personal subjects, and the tone is much more relaxed. From time to time, my fellow diners can't resist. Many of them have never eaten with a priest, and the last time they personally met a representative, representative of the clergy goes back to childhood. The first questions, of course, are about the Vatican. Is it true what they say? So, have you seen the young pope on Netflix? Then maybe someone starts talking about themselves, about what she or he thinks about some of the fundamental things of life. 
and recount something about her or his religious experience. I listen attentively and then recount something about my personal experience. At the dinner table, sincere stories make all plates more tasty. So Claudia, back to you. Is there a connection between food and artificial intelligence? Can they both promote quote unquote sustainability? Absolutely, yes. And uh, um, I, would, uh, I would start saying that uh, uh, I'm in charge of technology and innovation basically since uh, 2011. Uh, I started with uh, the former Minister of Italy for Innovation, that is uh, Professor Nicolaes. Uh, but when I met uh, uh, Father Andrea, uh, all my perspective changed a lot. Uh, because you're asking me about artificial intelligence. Now I know, uh, thanks to uh, Andrea and the book that I always have with me, of course, now I know that uh, uh, we should start uh, before from the ethics, uh, uh, ethics uh, for design, which is uh, much uh, uh, different from something related to spirituality uh, or uh, um, religion, as he said, uh, uh, he should embrace different religions. And with this spirit, uh, uh, actually, I'm founding with an Italian entrepreneur, Humans for Nature, uh, following exactly what I have learned from um, Don Andrea, which of course uh, involve uh, uh, the cooperation with the Future Food Institute. So yes, artificial intelligence is uh, totally um, related also to food systems as well as uh, um, uh, pro-life during life. Uh, that was something that uh, Andrea um, explained to, to me and to all of us. Um, I would say that uh, all the data-driven farming uh, uh, and all the um, data in order to augment the decision-making in farming uh, systems uh, are improving uh, not only the outcome in terms of uh, crop yields or, uh, as I said before, the profit part, which is something we should take into consideration to protect farmers and environmental sustainability, uh, as well as food, food security, uh, but uh, it, it is more, it's uh, a tool if, uh, uh, if the ethics uh, is uh, by design, it is a tool that can actually uh, empower all of us uh, uh, to optimize the natural resources, to protect the planet, uh, to improve uh, human health, uh, as well as planet health uh, and to implement uh, those models that I was uh, telling you about before uh, related to integral ecology, uh, which again, uh, we can find into the Laudato Si uh, encyclica, uh, uh, which is strictly connected with artificial intelligence, although we shouldn't tell it uh, immediately. Uh, but we should consider that, uh, uh, again, just a tool. Um, I think that this message for uh, all the people uh, working with technology is uh, uh, crucial uh, because uh, otherwise uh, we are designing a future that will not include uh, us uh, in. Okay, Father Andre. Yeah, uh, uh, I think that. Uh, the video that we have just uh, seen is uh, uh, really good, uh, well made because it shows three things. It shows a world, a planet. It shows uh, uh, technologies, many different technologies. And it shows uh, uh, people. The ethic perspective is uh, the ability to put together these three things, people, planet, and technology. A technology that is able to serve the good relationship between people and planet. Another point of that video. That video uh, shows uh, not a simple man or a simple woman or a scenario. No, many different, many different faces many different places. 
because um, human life is always plural. You know? And we must protect these differences. And we must protect this multiplicity. This is, in my opinion, the other change of, of every ethical uh, approach of our world and our problem. Technology is a good instrument to do this. Should be, would be a, a, should be a good instrument for this project. Fantastic. Okay, so oh, that's well. <laughs> that's it. It's a great work, <laughs> not, not only fantastic thing. <laughs> it's a great work. It's, it is a great responsibility Thank for all, all of the people involved in this world. Yes, for companies, for uh, scientists, for uh, uh, politicians, uh, for, uh, for the churches too, for the churches too. The role in the church in this field is not to protect uh, their field and their uh, and their uh, their interest. Is to serve humanity, promoting an ethical vision of technology. Okay, let's see how it has been. Uh, Father Andrea's work was received after one year. Uh, yeah. Ad un anno dalla ROM Call for AI Ethics siamo ancora più convinti dell'importanza di un documento che venga firmato da più istituzioni possibili perché un progresso che non tenga conto del bene comune integrale di ogni singola persona e dell'intera famiglia umana rischia di essere negativo, distruttivo persino. Ecco perché abbiamo anche aperto dei contatti, delle possibilità di firme anche da parte delle altre religioni mondiali, perché siamo convinti che di fronte al pericolo di una algocrazia è indispensabile promuovere una algor etica, ossia una tecnica che sia al servizio dell'uomo e non viceversa. Fantastic. So moving on to our next round table, digital meeting places, will they soon be considered useless because there is no digital equivalent of the coffee break? On page 24 of Father Andrea's new book, he writes, and again, my translation from the original Italian, not even the pandemic blocked this frenetic flux of exchange. The meetings were simply moved from the Roman headquarters to digital platforms. After a few weeks, we all discovered that it wasn't so bad. On the contrary, Mario Lubetkin, the vice director of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, with whom I interact with at every event, tells me how the whole trans wholesale transfer of every meeting onto digital platforms has accelerated attendance and participation at all different kinds of meetings. Before that, you had to jump onto planes and pay for hotels, now you just have to click once on your PC seated at your own desk or even on the couch. The one thing that the computer screen and internet connection haven't yet figured out, the coffee break. That coffee break is sorely missing at this meeting to many of the attendees, to Mario and to me, because ideas walk on the legs of people and relationships grow more easily when munching on something together. Here, in this case, we are condemned to talk about food without ever tasting it. So, Claudia, what does the Future Food Institute think about digital meetings? Are they sustainable? Well, um, usually when thinking about the sustainability of uh, digital meetings, uh, uh, people compare uh, them with uh, um, all the transport that we avoid by meeting us uh, uh, online. Uh, we should also think that uh, uh, the web in general, so using internet, uh, is uh, uh, the fourth nation in terms of uh, greenhouse gases emissions uh, after China, after United uh, um, uh, states uh, and after uh, India. Uh, 
so um, we uh, we should um, like explain also to the new generation the gen z that is using uh, uh, social media uh, a lot uh, that uh, um, this behavior um, has actually an impact on our planet uh, we can implement uh, worldwide uh, digital campaign for protecting the planet. Uh, we should know that there is a cost for the planet to doing that. Uh, say that, uh, um, of course, uh, digital meetings uh, are uh, super easy and uh, uh, allow us to uh, connect humans all over the world uh, without traveling. And during the pandemic era that we uh, still are living in a certain way, um, uh, uh, they can help. But again, I would say, uh, as, uh, uh, as a student of Father Andrea, I would say that uh, the use of these digital platforms should um, have an ethic by design. Uh, because um, young people uh, and in general humans should also know the very high price they are paying uh, in terms of uh, data they are uh, uh, giving as a gift uh, but also in terms of mental health uh, that is an issue um, that mysteriously is not uh, a priority although the data uh, on uh, the uh, increasing uh, of um, uh, disease related to mental health so there is not a, a, a specific answer, yes or no. It's very complex. And uh, Claudia, also going back to the environmental effect. Uh, so am I understanding that you're saying also that using these digital platforms is not uh, ne necessarily ecological, that it, it comes with a big cost, yet we're not really aware of it. So it may be like in the 1990s in the United States, in Europe, those countries they seem to be coming uh, to be becoming much um, less polluted much more green but that was because of uh, shipping their dirty work to other countries that would be uh, making shoes and polluting those countries instead of doing that in uh, in the in the wealthy western countries is that right yeah, I confirm, I confirm you that. And while talking about sustainability, this example that you are giving us uh, uh, bring me to uh, reflect also to uh, the definition of sustainability. It's not just the environmental side, the, the social aspect that you just mentioned uh, should be taken into consideration, of course. Okay, Father Andrea, your favorite coffee break that you can't have anymore. <laughs> it was a tragedy. Two years without coffee break. No, it's impossible to continue in this way <laughs> because we have two more problems. The first one is uh, the unofficial level of every work because uh, during the meeting, during every meeting, we have uh, the official celebration, the official speeches, talks, and so on. But uh, after that, uh, we have the unofficial part of a meeting of the work, when uh, every man and woman involved in the discussion stop to defend or promote his or her position and uh, speaks uh freely or more freely you know and at that point we have the opportunity to uh to to find new solutions to find together new perspectives so in my opinion the real point of of every work is coffee break <laughs> and the coffee break is impossible on zoom unfortunately but the second problem is more urgently. And the second problem is uh, our bodies. Uh, I think that one of the big challenge, the biggest challenge that new technology are imposing us is a reflection about our bodies. Metaverso, the new entry. In the field, the twenty okay, the, the, the oh, in the field of new technologies, what, what is the body? What's my body? This is uh, this is uh, no, uh, it's a big, big, big problem. 
And in, at this point, it's very interesting that a priest, a Catholic priest, is uh, involved to protect and promote the body. This is our goal, not the sources. Source. <laughs> no, <laughs> the Catholic Church works <laughs> to protect and to promote and to preserve the human body. Because this is our story. This is the possibility we have to meet someone, to, 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 produce, to, to promote human life, the, the bodies. I think that the bodies are the challenge that they, one of the most important and challenging topic we have. So, um, Father Andrea, to be clear, so you're uh, saying that the body needs to be defended uh, and in the metaverse, there's no place for a human body, but doesn't that go back to the sociological questions of Karl Marx saying that the body is defined by the material, and then on the other side, you have Kant saying, no, it's the soul that defines the material, that you have these two different, uh, well, these two different I, I, outlets. I, I, I not uh, I, I, usually I don't think the reality in a so uh, divide uh, way. Um, no, the, the reality is complex. Claudia told us uh, a few minutes ago, really complex. But I don't think that is a good way to divide the material or immaterial, spiritual or uh, physical. Uh, we have human reality. We have the reality. You know? We have the concrete world, and probably uh, and we, we every day we can discover that uh, the reality has uh, a spiritual uh, force and source, a spring, you know. But uh, this is possible only in a concrete, in a in a body, for example. So. Um, I don't like the dual vision of a human life. And so I prefer to, an holistic version. And so to go back to our conversation then about the coffee break, or um, we had the pleasure of having on uh, Claudia's colleague, Sara Roversi uh, last year, and she was telling us how the table is really, uh, and food, and the idea of sitting at a table with food, how it's a completely social phenomenon, and that it's just as important the, the, the eating aspect as a social aspect is. So uh, are you saying that that's what you're missing out on, that because there's no body, then you're missing out on this, um, on this, yeah, this, you, you cannot have that food and social aspect. Father Andrea. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry. I, I, I was waiting for Claudia. <laughs> sorry. Oh, Claudia, then please. Claudia. <laughs> no, sorry. Okay. Yes, the table and food is a social experience. It's not only a simple natural experience. It's a social experience. It's, it's, it's a fundament, it's the fundamental experience in which everyone can discover that is, is not enough to himself. Okay, someone must give me food at the beginning of my life. I'm, I, cannot found, I cannot find by myself food. I'm in relationship with another man, another woman. <laughs> oh, this is. And second point is so social that usually we don't like to eat alone. Yes, yeah, sometimes it happens, of course. Uh, sometimes it's very useful because uh, in a crazy day, 10 minutes alone is, is, is a great, a great opportunity, but uh, we, are, we, we don't like to, to eat every day alone. No? Uh, the table is a really a, a social experience when we put together, when we help each other to uh, to to nourish, to, to nourish our bodies and where everyone can discover his place in the world, in the society, in the table. You are recognized, you are uh, uh, welcomed, and you are you are, you are you have a place. And this is a grace. 
Claudia. So, uh, Father Andrea, yeah, thought, I, uh, that you would be the one uh, to respond to that question. Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it's uh, it's so powerful uh, in its sim simplicity uh, what uh, um, Andrea told us, uh, because food is uh, for sure uh, conviviality uh, and with the language of the culture of all of us uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, are just waiting to share uh, recipes uh, and stories uh, around food. Uh, the, um, I was speaking about uh, mental health, uh, but also um, in, a, in a bright side, uh, uh, food is uh, the fuel of uh, mind and emotion and uh, vice versa. Uh, and that is, uh, um, I think that we, we never eat alone in a certain way. If we think about uh, the hands, uh, the work uh, of the ingredients of the people uh, uh, that uh, brought that dish uh, on our table. Uh, the, the thing is that we never think about it. Uh, we think that uh, food uh, is growing uh, uh, on, a, uh, on a marketplace, I don't know. Uh, but we should uh, uh, reconnect uh, with all the people that uh, allow us uh, to actually eat. Uh, uh, so the holistic approach that Andrea was mentioning uh, is uh, super uh, crucial if we want to um, actually um, embrace the complexity of food systems, as well as uh, the systemic thinking, uh, the prosperity thinking that as a future food institute, thanks to Sara Roberti, Matteo Vignoli, uh, Chavi Giatuani, is the evolution of the design thinking. Uh, uh, this is not just an exercise uh, uh, of, of our minds. Uh, uh, it's a methodology that allows us uh, to uh, implement in field uh, those new models that we need uh, to uh, fix all the paradoxes of food. And of course, food is the first uh, entrance uh, with the nature and the environment. Uh, uh, and food tells us... Uh, um, not only through the traceability, it tells us the story of the territory it, ca it comes from, for instance. Wow, okay. So moving on to our final roundtable of tonight. Hunger as a curse and a blessing. And what happens when nobody comes to the table? On page 98 of Father Andrea's new book, he writes, and again, my translation from the original Italian, at this point, all that is left is the final lunch for the delegations. The two old guys, Pope Francis and Abdallah bin Baya, had taken their leave. It would not be a luxurious reception, but a fraternal moment of joy to worthily conclude this important day. Also here, each and every detail has been meticulously studied with care. It's Tuesday. The menu doesn't include pork and alcohol out of respect for the Islamic dietary rules, and the food for the Hebrew delegation has been cooked by a Roman kosher restaurant. The Christians, not having any such problems, adapt themselves to any food and are all ready to be seated at any table. Also, the service is intentionally a buffet to make sure that everyone feels free and comfortable. And yet, all of that isn't enough. As soon as the initial greeting finishes, the three groups divide themselves, each reciting their own prayers, the three delegations, seat themselves at separate tables, spe each speaks with his own, even the meal paces are so different that we have difficulty finding a common end to the lunch. I sit demoralized at one of the tables, of course, with fellow diners who are all Christians. Even the mozzarella in my plate has lost its flavor. The table, symbol par excellence of communion and sharing, is once again a place of separation and therefore a missed occasion for dialogue. It will be that way once again at Buenos Aires when in a few months time, we will sign the same declaration with Hebrew, Christian and Muslim Argentine leaders hosted by the local Catholic university. The succulent asado will be, oh well, just for us. Claudia, so is hunger both a curse and a blessing? And even if all of our food is sustainable, what if nobody comes to the table? 
Yeah, so you have read the, one of my um, favorite parts of the book uh, because I'm very, um, I'm studying a lot the food diplomacy aspect, uh, uh, which uh, um, is, is not a mainstream so far, but I think that is crucial uh, to uh, use food um, to uh, bring different cultures, different human beings uh, around the same table. Uh, and, and food can actually uh, teach us uh, um, to, uh, to raise our dialogue and conversation as always happens uh, when we are around a table sharing, uh, sharing food. Um, so um, what if no one will, will show um, up? Um, I, I can answer uh, talking about uh, the waste uh, that, by the way, uh, is polluting for more than 3.3 uh, billion tons of greenhouse gases. Uh, as you know, one third of food production is waste, and these are the numbers related to uh, pollution. Uh, but the waste that we would have uh, if no one would show to our table would be uh, higher um, because it, it would affect the possibility to create uh, the humana comunitas, as Pope Francis says, uh, uh, that uh, um, actually connects uh, uh, itself uh, to uh, its own uh, spirituality uh, and, and by this uh, to other humans, uh, uh, which represent the possibility in the agenda 2030, we would say that the goal is the 17, the partnership, uh, if we, so it would be a waste of humanity, uh, which would be uh, very dangerous for our own future. Wow, strong words, Father Andrea. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the story you told and you read before you, uh, is one of the, the uh, of the, the the unsuccess that we had. So the, the failure we had, uh, and in these days we are assisting the failure of religions in this terrible war in Europe, where religions are not instrument of peace, but a part of the conflict. This is not our goal. This is not our role in the story, in the human history. I'm sorry. Right. Father Andre, to be clear, you're speaking about the Russian Orthodox Church and the Ukrainian yes. Orthodox Church? <laughs> Yes, it's the same church. The, the strange is that it's the same church. There are one church, but on different part of the world, where the, my colleagues <laughs> are working not to, to promote a very difficult piece. Of course, it's not absolutely, it's not simple, no? but they are fighting. This is not the role of the church, of the Christian churches. This is not the role of every religion, in my opinion. So when religions are a source of division, we have a problem. We have a big problem. This, this doesn't mean that we must cancel our traditions, our cultures, our food, Law, of course, no problem. But if religions are source of division, we don't serve human life in this planet. And this is a sin, a terrible sin. Okay. So, <laughs> any, any final <laughs> thoughts, maybe, that are a little bit more positive? <laughs> Yes, we, have, we must be positive. So we have a lot of work to do. And the churches too are, must be involved in this great work we have to do. But uh, we, we have a lot of responsibilities. Yes, we have. Okay, final thoughts, Claudia? 
I cannot be, um, let's say, more agree with uh, um, uh, Father Andrea. And uh, um, I think that we, uh, we all should uh, uh, became the religion that we would uh, see. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, we, we should allow with our uh, being uh, uh, very passive, let's say, in uh, observing uh, uh, these divisions. Uh, um, on the contrary, we can uh, be the, the main characters uh, uh, in our planet. Uh, uh, even for uh, uh, religion or uh, whoever is uh, uh, speaking uh, something different than the truth. Okay, so there we have it. So let's see how we can stay in touch with Father Andre. First of all, let's see how we can get uh, his new book. Let's take a look here. Unfortunately, only in Italian today, but we hope soon in English too, <laughs> maybe in Tagalog, uh, in many different languages, <laughs> of course. There it is. So there's, and I will put this in the chat room right now for anybody who is interested. There it is. And let's see how we can stay in touch with Father Andrea. It is romecall.org. The Ren AI Science Foundation. So all you have to do is go down there, and there he is, Don Andrea Trucci, Secretariat Coordinator. Just click on the mail, and you'll have his email address, and people can reach out to you, Don Andrea, Father Andrea. Exactly. Wonderful. Okay, so he is available to hear your comments, answer your questions, and let's see how we can stay in touch with. Claudia Laricchia, there it is on LinkedIn.com, uh, Claudia Laricchia, and there's her contact info. So all you have to do is go on LinkedIn and you will find all of her information right there. So I will put that also in the, in the chat right now. And that's how I discovered that my mobile is public information. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you can reach Claudia at any time of the day. Just Please cancel it as soon as possible. I mean, yeah, just like... <laughs> so, um, so fantastic. So uh, thank you very, very much. And Claudia, it's okay then uh, people can reach out to you? Yes, of and, course. And hear your questions answered. Wonderful. So there it is. So um, thank you very much to Father Andrea Ciucci. Thank you very much to Claudia Laricchia. Thanks a lot. So let's take a look at what's coming up next week. We have Indre Viscontas, the queen, my lord, is dead. Professor Indre Viscontas, a neuroscientist and stage director, is making the final preparations for her newest production, the world premiere of the opera, The Queen, My Lord, is Dead, an opera based on Shakespeare's tragedy, Macbeth. As creative director of the Pasadena Opera, Indre has staged many well-known operas. What makes her production special is a unique neuroscience perspective she brings to them. Take, for example, her comments on her recent production of Janacek's Kachi Kabanova. Quote, modern neuroscience has begun to shift away from strict borders between a brain that's disordered and one that is not. Instead, we think about a spectrum of behavior of experience, of wiring. My hope is that we see, that we all see aspects of ourselves in every one of the characters, recognizing how different we each are and how hard it can be to satisfy our deep-seated need for human connection while retaining our individuality and being true to who we are." End quote. Shakespeare would surely agree. Come welcome Indre to our show for an exclusive look at her new production of the Queen, my Lord, is dead. As always, all information about upcoming shows can be found at www.simeonmoro.com. Again, that is Indre Viscontas, The Queen, my Lord, is dead, next Wednesday. So once again, thank you very much to Father Andrea Ciucci. Thank you very much to Professor Claudia Laricchia. Thank you to Agnieszka and Benoit Rivole for her support of this show. 
And most of all, thanks to you, our participants who make it all worthwhile. From the Vatican City State, Polica, Italy, New London, New Hampshire, goodbye. Let's see you next Wednesday. Ciao. Ciao, thank you.